Here is something that continues to amaze me. I have a sparse point cloud created here of a 3D arm and palm in the post shot program. And when I start the Gaussian splatting training process, I soon notice that something is forming on top of the palm. Something that was not visible in the original point cloud. How on earth is this possible? And what is the role of the actual sparse point cloud in all of this? Hello boys and girls, it's Olli here again. This time I'm not going to present any tutorials. This episode is more about observation and analysis of the Gaussian splatting process. I have learned quite a bit while developing my camera array tool for Blender and making synthetic Gaussian splatting models. After all the different experiments, I have understood that in this new 3D production method, the main ingredients and the most important parts are the source images, the cameras and their camera location data, and this so-called sparse point cloud. All three of these elements play an important role in the process where we are trying to generate 3D Gaussian splatting models. In real-life situation where we scan environments or object with a real camera, the most important role is played, of course, by the images themselves. Without source images, Gaussian models cannot be created. So images are the number one. And from the source images, we can then calculate and bustle out for these two other necessary elements. If we proceed along the basic path that is also familiar from the basic steps of photogrammetry, we can solve for the location of the cameras and the point cloud from the source images using the well-known structure from motion method. But when we produce synthetic Gaussian models, the starting point is slightly different. Synthetic models in this case means virtually created models, where existing 3D models are converted to Gaussian versions via a 3D program such as Blender. And because in this way we have the opportunity to influence and collect the camera data and location coordinates directly from the 3D program, we are able to produce this element without a separate structure from motion calculation. As before, all three of these elements are still needed. But in the 3D program, in virtual environment, we are also free to specify what kind of a point cloud is generated from the model. And this is where it gets interesting. The role of the sparse point cloud in the Gaussian splatting process is to act as a starting point that gives directions to the structure and visual representation of the model. It acts as a kind of anchor around which the final model is built. A sparse point cloud provides a rough geometric framework in relation of camera location data and that defines where and how spatial elements related to the scenes are located. But the question is how sparse can this point cloud actually be and how much of the entire model does it need to cover? It seems that actually not that much. If we look at, for example, that synthetic skull model that I showed you in the intro, I can reveal how it's made. I have built this model entirely in Blender, where I have added this skull and this piece of clothing objects to this 3D arm. After that, I created this camera rig around the model using an icosphere object and the camera array tool that I have developed. This way I can then render the source images of the entire model from every angle I need. And there are only 80 PNG images in total in this project. 
After that, I can extract and create a camera data file from all 80 of these cameras into a text file, where a script I programmed will collect all the 3D coordinates and location information about the cameras. So all that remains is to create a sparse point cloud element. Although I could create a point cloud of the entire model and all its parts, in this case I collect the points only from this arm piece and intentionally leave out the skull and this piece of clothing from the sparse point cloud data. My Blender code creates the point cloud from the vertex points of the object, so there are relatively few of them. And now, when I import all these cornerstone elements into the postchart program, I can see that only the point cloud representing the arm exists there. The location of the cameras also looks the same as in Blender and seems to be in the right place in the 3D space relative to the point cloud of the arm. So there is no reference to the skull or this garment in the 3D model, we only have source images with the rendered pixels of these objects. And yet, when we start the Gaussian training process, this amazing algorithm is able to generate the splats from these objects and place them correctly in 3D space. These missing parts can be trained out from the scratch and the only guide which is needed to place them in the 3D space is this very light, sparse point cloud of this arm. And this, I think, is amazing. So, to be or not to be, this makes you wonder what is the actual role of the sparse point cloud if we can generate the rest of the Gaussian model from such a few amount of points. In this light, it seems that the most important parts are the source images and the camera data which we gathered consist enough 3D information to train a working 3D model. So how much impact is left for the sparse point cloud after all? Since this example was a Gaussian training from an object-centric model, and overall it was just a very simple synthetic creation, we should probably do also some testing from a different scenario, so that we can verify whether such a small number of points works to produce a complete environment. Here I have a 3D visualization of the interior, a virtual living room where I have some furnitures and some interesting details on the tables and the walls. To create decent source images of this space, I first need to build a box tower made up from several boxes where the top and bottom faces are removed. I scale the top and the bottom vertices a little wider so that the cameras that will be attached to them later looks slightly upwards at the floor level and downwards near the ceiling. Then I copy these towers and place them at appropriate intervals around the room. After that I create cameras with the camera array tool for these box towers so that they point outwards. This way I have enough angles to see everything that is relevant in this room. The final rendering took quite a while because the total number of source images in this project is 692. But that brings us to the interesting part of how to actually create a point cloud of such a room. What objects should be included in it for the Gaussian calculation to work? After a few experiments I noticed that the room model actually contains two complex elements, like this carpet or these curtains, whose vertex points are already too dense that the point cloud data becomes too large. If the point cloud file starts to be over a gigabit, the process has real difficulties reading it and cannot produce a Gaussian splatting model. So a point cloud which is too dense can be a bad thing. 
That's why objects like these must be excluded from the point cloud data. When I look at the walls and the ceiling of the room, I see that they are made only from simple boxes. And these boxes only have very few vertex points in the corners of the object. So surfaces like these that cover large areas of the model and act as a frame for the entire room area should have more points on their surfaces. Fortunately, in Blender we have the ability to use function made with geometry nodes that allows us to randomly add points to the surfaces of any geometry. With this tool we can also adjust how densely the dots are spread over the object. Using geometry node tool I now only apply points to these elements that represent the ceiling, floor and the walls of the room. I leave out all the smallest details like these paintings, lamps and all these little objects on the tables and shelves. So when we start the Gaussian planning training in the post shot, the point cloud is relatively very sparse and we can just very roughly see the major shapes of the room borders and the main furnitures. And now when we start the training process, it takes a little while when the iteration starts to achieve the level of accuracy where we can clearly identify details of the room with all the paintings and the walls and the rest of the objects. But we can clearly see that this kind of an interior model with all its details can be generated and trained out to a Gaussian splatting model from such a very sparse point cloud. So this makes you think that is the sparse point cloud necessary at all? Could this model be done without it? Since it is written as a mandatory part of the Gaussian splatting algorithm, I still believe that the sparse point cloud has some significance. Although this experiment shows that point cloud created using different methods can be very indicative. For example, the colors of the points have a bearing on how quickly the splat structures is formed during the training process. The point clouds I produce in Blender are unable to assign color values to individual points. They are all just white points. When we produce a model through the traditional structure from motion method, then we can have colors for our point cloud, since computer vision can pick them up from the source images. But the end result is still the same. Whether the points are colored or just white, the process is able to produce a working Gaussian splitting model either way. Only minor differences I have noticed when using different splats profiles. The so-called older ADC method seems to work a bit better for synthetic models than the newer MCMC profile. ADC produces a splat structure from inside out and it is slightly faster, while MCMC method shoots the splats from outside in, leaving a lot of hidden splats around the actual model during the process. This may not have anything to do with the structure of the sparse point cloud, or at least I haven't fully understood how the sparse point cloud could affect to these two different profiles, because in both cases the end result is very close to the same. In any case, I found this very fascinating and all these tests that I have managed to create using synthetic models make me think what if this could be applied to reality? What if we could connect a partially constructed point cloud from a virtual environment to a 3D scan of the real world? If we just could capture 3D location data from a real-world camera while recording the source images, then this might work and speed up the creation of Gaussian models. 
For example, this would already be possible in a motion capture volume. There, 3D coordinates from real camera movement can be transferred to the virtual camera. And this has already been used in several film productions, such as James Cameron's Avatar. So, with similar methods, we would then also be able to place and track the position of objects, which we try to scan in the volume, such as various standard furnitures, and then use those as replacement elements for the sparse point cloud. At least, in theory, this way we could bypass the structure from motion phase and quickly generate Gaussian models via modified sparse point clouds. But of course, this same thing is done by already developed SLAM scanners, such as the very efficient Lixel scanner from the Chinese manufacturer Xcrits. With its LiDAR capabilities, a very large point cloud can be scanned in real time and connected to the 360 images and then use that combination to produce Gaussian splatting models. All the demos which I have seen of this scanner seems very promising, and this kind of a technology is probably the most efficient way at the moment to produce large areas in this 3D format. But this is getting a bit off topic now. I hope I managed to present some interesting aspects of the role of sparse point clouds. If you are interested in synthetic Gaussian models, my camera array tool can be found in my online store on Gumroad. I will leave a link in the description. If you managed to watch this so far, and if you like the video, hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. I will continue my research in the middle of point clouds. Thanks for watching.